Okay, so we are um, on our last week at looking at Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's a really powerful sermon, which isn't surprising as it was given by the Son of God, Jesus himself. And without going back over what we've had at the past, although I'm going to end with a bit of a, a bit of a run through a recap of it so that we can hold it all in our minds, but now just reflecting on last week. Um, last week, our passage started off with Jesus sort of giving a summary of what he'd said before. So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So a little bit like the greatest command or the second half of it, when Jesus was asked um, what the greatest of the commandments was, it was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. So he sort of... Um, Jesus is incredible and in fact so much easier than some of the other New Testament writers because he just keeps things very simple and easy to understand, uses pictures an awful lot. And so we started after that verse last week, we looked at some of the pictures, having all that he'd said in the sermon, summing it up in that, that command to love others as you would want to be loved yourself, he then goes on to talk about the different choices you had. And last week, we looked at the choice between entering through the narrow gate and being on the narrow path that leads to life or entering through the wide gate and living and walking on that wide road that leads to death. We then went on after that, and there was the, the challenge or the, the warning to take care where it comes to teachers and false teachers. And because we, we know that there's going to be many out there that don't want to see us on that narrow road. They don't want to see, because they are um, following the God of this world, they don't want to see people entering through that narrow gate. And so there was a warning to test, to, to check. And Jesus, again, gave us such a vivid picture to keep it clear, saying, by their fruit, you know them. Yes. And we want to keep that in mind because of the, the next picture that we're going to have this week, because it's on a similar idea. If we've just looked at the fact that we can, we can know, keeping it simple, we can know truth from false or people who are speaking the truth against false teaching by their fruit. And um, we looked a little bit at what fruit is. We're now going to pick up in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Audrey, would you be able to read those for us? Yes, sure, Nikki. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. It's a very sobering passage. Yeah. And I think one that we need to be quite clear on, because in a sense, sometimes it's just looked at all on its own and not in the context of what's gone before. So if we just remember, the context is we've just been talking about the choice of the different roads and we've been talking about the fruit. And you could say in, in a similar way that um, a false teacher um, is going to have bad fruit because um, they come from a bad tree. We could also say that um, that false teacher is also walking on that wide road. It follows, doesn't it? So yeah. the wide road is going to have people who some of them are false teachers, some of them are just, just on the wide road for their own reasons, not interested in God, rejecting God. But the fruit of that road, the fruit, fruit of that life is going to be simply put bad fruit. Hi, Yolanda. Good to have you. Hey, you. And the, the people um, on the narrow road are, are going to be having good fruit because we know the source of the fruit is not ourselves. It's through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives when we have a genuine, genuine relationship with, with Jesus. Yolanda, we've just read the first two verses. I'll post them again as, there we are. I hope they came up onto the screen. Um, okay, so going on from that idea of the roads and the fruit, Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if we just take that slowly, entering, we looked last week at the word enter. 
So entering the kingdom of heaven, we saw the parallel, or it's another way of saying, saying entering through the gate, the narrow gate, yes. and entering onto the narrow road. And we saw last week that Jesus is, was it last week, uh, that Jesus yes. is the gate. And, um, and so he's now saying just a few breaths later, really, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom is on that narrow road. Um, and so the question we might ask before going on for more of what he, he tells us is, why would someone be saying, Lord, Lord, um, and yet not be on that, that narrow road? Good evening, Elizabeth. Good to have you. Good evening. I'm on audio and video of because work is going on. I'll just sure, no worries. Okay, so why, why would it be, or can you give an example of why it would be that someone would say, Lord, Lord, and actually they're not on the narrow road? Because they might be saying, calling God's name, or saying, going to church, but then outside church, they're doing whatever they like. So they are, they are, they are saying the same thing, they're just not walking the walk. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to... We're going to see that um, further on down in the verse, but you're absolutely right. There are many people who do claim to be believers, will pray, will say, Lord, Lord, but they actually haven't come. And we, we've looked at it all through the Sermon on the Mount, haven't we? Right from right at the beginning, entering that first verse was blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize their spiritual poverty, their humility and need of God, for theirs is the kingdom. So that, that was the entering in into a, a salvation. So there's many people. Why, why is it that people are like that? Because it's tragic, isn't it? Because very often those people who are saying, Lord, Lord, but as Yolanda says, um, maybe Sunday or Friday Christians, um, do you think that they genuinely believe that that's enough? Audrey. So I'm, I'm just thinking, Nikki, it was the culture of those times. So you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of them were promoting a kind of a, a parallel religion, if you want to say, call it, you know. So what they had done was they had kind of twisted what God had, the Ten Commandments. And that's why Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say. And so that Lord, Lord became an outward expression. It was, he called them whitewashed tombs, right? Because they were just, they were just mouthing pleasantries, you know, the right words, but not, it's, it's, it, it was not reaching on the inside. So it was more of a, a cerebral expression than a heart change mm. and a walk with God, as you said. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the sad thing is, many of them would have learned that from the people, you know, the baton would have been passed on to them from the people before them. And they might have quite, hi, Letitia, by the way, good to see you there they may well, more than likely, have thought that that was sufficient, that that was it, that they were ticking those boxes, they were securing themselves an eternity or, you know, a future, and um, not, not realized anything different about that. And so Jesus really challenged the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were more learned. They, they should have known better, but they were um, passing that on to the average woman and man on the street and they were following likewise. So there was, um, is there any other reason? Letitia, we were just asking, um, why is it that people who say, Lord, Lord, actually haven't entered through that narrow path? Why would it be? And Audrey was saying that's because um, they've been brought up to think that it's just a going through the motions, the doing of the law. Um, what about nowadays? Do we still have that today? There is an element of, um, of legalism, isn't there, in, in the church, in certainly in certain places, um, where people are brought up thinking, well, if I've been baptized, or I was christened, or I go to church on Sundays, or even I go to church Easter and Christmas, I've done my bit. So there's certainly a superficialness out there. Um, and that we need to guard against and really challenge each other not to be superficial. Um, there's also, there may be hypocrisy, you know, those that think that um, as long as I'm this good 
on one side, I can be bad and I, you know, keep the balance somehow, um, I'm going to be okay. And so hypocrisy um, is certainly out there. And so Jesus is saying that many people who say, Lord, Lord, will not enter. And it says here, um, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So the criteria that Jesus is giving us, it's not the only criteria, or you could say if it is the only one, it's an overreaching one, because that would have to include the will of the Father, meaning that we first of all come to him in humility with repentance, recognizing our need for him. But um, the criteria for entering the kingdom of heaven is obeying Jesus, obeying God, doing his will. Any thoughts before I ha ask another question? Audrey. Nikki, I was thinking, you know, about what Paul said to the Corinthian church, chapter 13, yeah, in his first letter that, you know, do I speak in the tongues of men, but if I have not love, right? Then he talks about prophesying, and that's what, what is cited here, you know, yeah. didn't you prophesy in your name? So he says, yeah, and, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I have not love... And when we look at the, the, the most basic commandment is love the Lord your God and love one another. It yes. boils down to that. And so what does that mean? You know, uh, obeying the commands of God. And there, it's out there. Put yes. very simply. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Because out of love comes everything. I mean, the whole, the whole commandments are summed up in love. If we don't love, then, then yeah, it sort of is the covers it all doesn't it yes you've gone on to talk about what comes next and the reason I was tying it up with the fruit earlier is because many people would claim that what happens in this verse is fruit so the next bit we've said many will come and say but did we not prophesy in your name mm. and in your name did we not drive out demons and in your name did we not perform miracles and Jesus says, I never knew you. And so some people might say, well, surely that's fruit. Surely if you're um, performing miracles or speaking prophecies or doing signs and wonders, that that is fruit. And because Jesus previously, when we talked about it last week, said, by your fruit, you know those that are on the narrow road. By your fruit, you know the false teachers that are on the wide road. So my, my question is, and it's, a, it's quite challenging, is um, are those things fruit? Any thoughts? No. The fruit Bible talks about, it is not a doing of miracles. It is not about a casting out demons. It is the character. The Christ-like character, that is the fruit he's talking about. And therefore, you may possess all this, that uh, you have the, the, the spirit to cast out demons. But if you don't have the character, you will miss it. Like you have been saying, I, I wanted to say it earlier, that uh, sometimes uh, it's about, I know a lot of people say, okay, you, you guys, you said uh, I should accept Christ. Is that not it? My name is written in the book of life. So it is done and it is settled. For me to do other things, that is out of the case. But so far as I have accepted Christ as my Lord and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, it is done. What I do after all doesn't matter. So that is, I think that is where Jesus is coming from. Like he says, he said, it is he who does the will of my father. It is not only when you accept him and then you live your life as you please. No. So it is about you walking the walk of him whom you, you claim you have accepted. And so therefore it is doing his will. And it is the doing of the will of the father is what is so difficult. So that's what we learned last week about the narrow road and then the broad. So people... Others will prefer, okay, I have, my name is written in the book of life, so I will walk on the broad road because that place, there are so many pleasures there and I will enjoy life. So it is not uh, casting out demons and 
uh, prophesy speaking in tongues, that is the fruit. No, it is none of the fruit. The fruit is, which is love that produces the other things. So it is all about love. Thanks, Kati. absolutely. And I think often it's often, this is often misunderstood. Now there's nothing wrong with the manifestations of the spirit. They um, are listed in Corinthians and Romans and Ephesians, I think it is. And um, there's many gifts that come with the, the spirit. The ones that um, he's quoting here are those more those um, dramatic ones, aren't they? And my own opinion, quite, my, quite feel quite strongly that the fruit of the spirit, which number one is, is love, but as you say, charity leads on to the other fruit like patience, um, forbearance, generosity, um, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of those fruit. Um, for my, my opinion is that those fruit qualify us for ministry. Yes. And it, it isn't like, oh, well, you know, a bit like where, where James says, well, you say I have faith and you have works. You know, it's not one or the other. If there isn't love in the fruit in our lives, even if God has given us that acorn of, of a, um, a, a gifting, it should, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be exercising it if we've not yet got love in our lives, if we've not got, yet got some of that joy. I mean, I know for all of us on that journey of maturity, the fruit might be at different stages. And I'm not saying that we can't be ministering until the fruit are like fully grown, but if there isn't sign of that spiritual life seen in the fruit of um, character, then we're not ready at a place. We're still babes. We're still needing milk. We're still needing to grow up in our salvation. We shouldn't be ministering. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that sound harsh to you? It's real. I mean, it makes it sense. Yeah, because if you don't have that spiritual, you know, the fruit comes because our roots are deep into the, the living water, into the word, into prayer, into fellowship, into walking in the spirit, then there will be fruit. And you can have that quite early on in your Christian walk if you're, you know, you're abiding in Christ and he's abiding in us. But if you're not, then we, we shouldn't be yet exercising those gifts. So, so here Jesus is saying, many will say, Lord, Lord. And when he says, I don't know you, they're not saying, oh, but I was loving and compassionate and merciful and generous and hospitality and loving. You know, they're saying, oh, but I did miracles and, you know, cast out demons. Um, and to back up what you're saying, Charity, let's look at a couple of cross references because they're claiming, in a sense, they're claiming to be something. They're saying, Lord, Lord. And when you say Lord, Lord or Father, Father, you're claiming to be his child. Let's look at two verses from um, 1 John. Um, Yolanda, are you able to see that and read that? 1 John 1, 6 to 7. Yes, please. If we claim um, 1, John 1, to, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. Thank you. I love the letter of one John, because he really, John really speaks to the, the point. He doesn't beat around the bush. And in chapter one and two of one John, he has about six or seven claims. If you claim if you claim this, if you claim that, if you say this, and, and he's sort of pointing out the hypocrisy of claiming one thing and yet living another way. So here we have, if you claim to have fellowship with him, meaning Jesus, and yet you're walking in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. And the encouragement though, is that if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. So many people will claim one thing and live a different life. Um, Audrey, will you read our second one, John? Yes, sure. One John chapter two, verses four to six. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, 
love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Amen. It's a hard letter, but if anyone ever asks you, how can I be sure of my salvation? A good study of 1 John really can help with that. Because one, he speaks really clearly, like we're reading here, but then he goes on to unpack it more. How can we tell um, that we're walking in that light? So here he says, those who say, I know him, I know Jesus, but don't do his commands, you're lying. You know, there's, you know if, you, if, you're, if you're going to claim one thing and not prepared to live it, then it's not true. And so this really backs up what, um, what Jesus is saying. Many will claim one thing and actually not, not live that. So ultimate fruit, as we've said, is love. And it's those things that we read about in Galatians as fruit. But it's also evidence that we're obeying God and that we know him. Nikki, can I and, say something here, please? Yeah, please. Uh, I was thinking of John 10, uh, the Gospel of John and 10. We've, we've been looking at that, where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and the gate, you know, and all of that. And if you just scroll down to verse 14, he says, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep. He says, I know my sheep and am known by my own. And he says, you're away from me. I, I don't know you. If Jesus says, I don't know you, then, uh, then there's a disconnect. There's something terribly wrong about what we are claiming. Yes. I was thinking of Old, Old Testament terminology where when you speak about uh, a man knowing his wife, it speaks of intimacy, a oneness, a communion, where, where fruit in, 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 the, in the physical, you'll have children, you know, generations are birthed. And that's what God is doing with us. So the fruit of the spirit get birthed in us when we know, when we are in communion with God, mm -hmm. when we become one with him in that love, love relationship. And it's not like, you know, it's, it's a distant thing where uh, one is just mm -hmm. receiving and, uh, you know, I, I'm living as an island and my God in me, and I have nothing to do with the other part of the command that those two commandments. So it has to be, it, ha it has to be lived out in its, its totality for yes. me to be like you said, I, the, the fruit will be, uh, will be seen in me as I minister, but it's, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a, you know, one feeding of the other uh, process as, as the fruit comes, you know, is seen, is seen in me, I begin to exercise it and it grows further. And I, I, you know, it, it, it gets shared and the ministry carries on and people are benefited by it. And that knowing is, a, I mean, it comes out of that knowing, sorry. It comes out of that being one with God. Yes. So, this, this no, so when he says, I never knew you, it just struck me. It is very, uh, it, it's, what, uh, there's a word I'm looking for. It, the, the gravity of it, yes. You know, yes. It, it's very grave. It has significance. When he says, I don't, it, it would be like a door shutting in my face. If you think of the 10 virgins, you know, five of them were ready and they went and they had lambs trimmed, they had their oil and they went in and the other ones who, who were slow to come, he says, I don't know you. Mm. I don't know you. So yeah. It's a yeah, beautifully explained, Audrey. And very sobering. Yeah. And that's why Paul in one of his letters, I haven't got it here, but says, test yourself and see if you're in the faith. And I hope that you pass that test. He wasn't wanting to leave people condemned. He, it wasn't that he wanted to say, you're not good enough. You know, you're not, you're not following those rules that have been set well enough. But he was really wanting um, his readers to, to go, you know, is there fruit in my life? Is there, do I know God? Is there, as you say, Audrey, that no is the, the knowledge, the relationship? Is that evident in, in, in my relationship with Jesus and evident in the life as a, an outworking of it? And if not, Paul's motive was to, um, to, to, to have that challenge and that recognition leading to the humbling of oneself and truly coming into that narrow road. Yolanda, you looked like you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted a bit of clarification. Because even there was the, um, I think the verse Auntie Audrey read earlier, which says, so if you read the one verse, why well, it starts from the beginning, it talks about the fact that Jesus Christ has died and everything for us, and he's, he's our sanctification and everything. How do you then 
are able to tell because it's a test yourself. The, uh, um, what we're discussing, there were people who are thinking that they go and say, I know God, and God says, I don't know you. So then how is it that they are deceiving themselves that they know God? Or how do you really know for sure? You know, there are days you're like, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. There are days you're like, are you really the, this imposter syndrome that comes in like with yes. your character? Are, are you really? <laughs> yes. yes. And the point of the scriptures that um, challenge us to check, you know, like Psalm 139, which says, Lord, test me and check if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. Or Paul saying, check yourself that you're in the faith. Or Paul to the Philippines says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. All these verses are, are not to make us feel condemned, but going back to what I always go back to, that, that, that road with the curbstones, those times where we're like, you know, God's happy, lucky to have me on his team. Look how well I'm doing. We hit that curbstone and we go, you know, the word says, test yourself and then we need to soul search and come before God again and say Lord I can just test I can just see this this pride growing in me am I yours and and seek that confirmation and it will come draw near to God and we'll have that confirmation and on other times where you know where we we're feeling so low and we're like well God can't love me I've messed up again we hit the curbstone that says you're my child you know, I love you in everlasting love. Your sin is, is, is like white before me now. And, and that encouragement, how can we be sure? Ultimately, we need to be um, accountable to each other. We need to have friends that we could go to if we need it and say, you know, I'm just feeling really discouraged at the moment. Have you seen real fruit in my life? Am I, you know, and you need friends to come alongside and say, Yolanda, you know, I've seen true evidence of the Spirit's work in your life. You, you, you know, let's, let's pray together. Or we need friends that are going to challenge us and say, well, to be honest, you're claiming it. I see certain things that seem good in your life, but I also see you often just walking your own path. I don't know. Because this is a question for all of us. How, and I think I've posed it before, but what looking like evidence from the outside what is the difference between someone that claims to be a Christian and perhaps is just walking the walk in their own strength? And, you know, maybe life's fairly easy and to be kind and to be nice and generous is in your nature. How does that person look different to someone that has a true salvation, but it's a bit lukewarm? How do they, they look side by side, the safe person that's lukewarm or the unsaved person that's making a bit of effort. Wow. Hmm? Wow, I said, <laughs> we got to think about that. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's much of a difference, Nikki. There isn't. And yeah. that's why, that's why Jesus gives those parables like the parable of the weeds. When you remember the weeds come up with the, the, the um, wheat. And the workers say to the, the master, can we go in and pull the weeds up? And Jesus says, don't pull up the weeds because you'll pull up some of the wheat at the same time. And I think to, to my mind, scripture is quite clear that um, often the warning of check yourself is, if you're in the faith is because those two can look very similar. I know for myself, I was backslidden from the age of about 15 to about 23. Now I think that I had a true commitment as a teenager. And I think there was growing fruit, but if I'm honest, looking back on it now, I was a bit of a roller coaster. I, I had highs and I had lows. And um, God really met me when I was 23 and I recommitted my life. But I can't honestly, hand on heart, tell you if I was saved as a teenager or if the true salvation came at 23. All I can say is thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness because I don't know. And I might have, you know, I cannot rely, I couldn't have relied on that childhood or that teenage faith because it looked the same. The back, my black slidden-ness looked just the same as people that claim it, but are, are just doing it in their own strength. Does that make sense? And so in times in my life when I've had people that have said to me this sort of question, you know, how do I tell? I haven't gone immediately and said to them, you know, if, if we're private talking on our own, I haven't immediately said to them, don't worry, you know, I'm sure you're saved. You've been coming to church for a long time. I haven't given them that 
quick just sort of bumper sticker reassurance because it's a legitimate question. If someone's asking it, it might be because they don't have much passion for God. It might be because going to church on a Friday is like hard work. It's they're not running to it. It might be that they, they're not feeling particularly loving and there's not fruit. And so it might be a legitimate God's wake up to them saying, you're going through the motions, but you haven't actually had a change of heart. Or maybe they're needing that conversation to suddenly realize in, in conversation with me or with you, if you have that opportunity to realize that they're on skating on thin ice because they don't look much different than the person that's going to hear, I don't know you. And best they have that wake up call and turn passionately to God and say, Lord, save me. Um, does, that, does that make sense to you? So yeah, my, my challenge is Yolanda for anyone is we don't want to, you know, I, I feel now I've been walking the walk for, or, you know, had a relationship with the Lord for so many years now, I don't doubt my salvation. I sometimes doubt that I'm, I often doubt that I'm worthy. I say, you know, in prayer, you know, Lord, why would you want me? You know, I'm a, a poor servant and, and I, I feel humbled by my inadequacies, but I don't, I don't doubt my salvation, but I've had a lot of years to wrestle with that and to, to work it through, but we shouldn't ever take casually that that question. Any questions or thoughts? My question is, uh, like you, you were speaking, I was listening and uh, the question is, if we want to, yes, Paul said we should examine ourselves, yes. So you, you come before the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you ask the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit reveals yourself to you, who you are and where you are at with him. And the question you were asking about the lukewarm and the one who thinks uh, he's living the life, isn't it that uh, if we want to strive to be like Christ, we are doing it on our own merit? Because Bible, there is no way we, 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 will, we will tell ourselves, charity, oh, you have arrived, you are perfect today if Christ come. You are going. Your works ha it will testify about that. No, if I come to that place, then it means I am depending on my own works, the works of the flesh, not taking advantage of the grace that has been given to me, living in the righteousness of God. That doesn't mean that I can't. I don't have to work out my salvation, asking the Holy Spirit each day to help me live like Him. So therefore. If we get to that place and we ask ourselves to assess ourselves or other people telling us, uh, I don't even know how to frame the question. Does it mean that, that doesn't it look like we are doing it on our own merits or we, we, on our own works, allowing our works to lead us? Because this morning I was listening to one of our pastors back home. He says that there are a lot of people in church who thinks that because he or she goes to church, she is saved. The person having confessed Christ as Lord and thinks that, oh, I have the best pastor, so I am saved and I'm going to heaven. He says that, forget it, you're a joke. But our guarantee or assurance of salvation is publicly declaring Jesus as Lord and Savior. And our righteousness is, is merited to us through the finished work on the cross. Jesus taking our sin and giving us his righteousness. Yes, and therefore he, he wants us to walk the walk he is calling us to walk. But if we get to the place we always want to know, oh, am I walking right? Am I working right? Are we not uh, doing it? on our own merit, like on our own strength. Yeah, but um, I guess it, it looks at different seasons in our lives. It can look mm -hmm. like that. You know, if, if we stop having good quiet times and spending time with God and that isn't that disconnect isn't there, then we can very easily find ourselves doing it in our own strength. And sometimes we'll come to the point where we we're, we're go, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this by sheer effort, 
and I've lost that that grace, that um, relationship and, and walking the walk because of the Holy Spirit in me. And so that can come in true believers, they can start doing it. I mean, Paul talked to the Galatians and said, you were saved by faith and now you're going back to works? What are you doing? So I think it's possible to have a true salvation and through whatever, there's so many multiple things that we can do, just not remaining in the vine, we can end up going back to works. And so, yes, it's a little, what, what I'm really thinking more about the legitimate question if people ask themselves when they're newer in that walk or if they're, they're not growing as believers. But I think if we're growing um, and there's fruit, we give glory to God that the fruit came from him because it's, he's the source, <laughs> you know, the fruits come because we're in, in, in the water where our roots are in the water and even that desire comes from God. I don't know if, if, if that helps, but yes. And we also need to remember, um, it's it, Jesus here said, those that claim Lord, Lord, we must be very careful um, when we talk about claiming, it's not enough to claim with our mouth, Lord, Lord, if it hasn't actually happened, because anyone can say Lord, Lord, can't they? Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an outward profession of an inner reality that is seen to be true by how we live our lives. I don't know if that, if that sounds a bit wordy, but we, we proclaim it outwardly because it's happened inwardly and the truth of it is exposed or seen by the fruit. So it's all through, if someone says, well, I've claimed Jesus as Lord, but I don't see the fruit in their lives or the transforming power of God at work, then I would say to them gently and in love, you know, take them back to that beginning you know, have you recognized you're, you're, you're a sinner? Have you, have you come through that narrow gate? I think I, we're- I, 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 I want to come in. I asked that question because uh, you said earlier on that uh, if you are not bearing the fruits, you, then there is, there's no need for you to be a leader or lead people. But uh, can it be, because sometimes if we want to, get to that place for instance uh, what, let, let me let's let me just take uh, use you as a scenario i see nikki on the road and somebody has really made you angry and you're angry does that mean nikki is not bearing the fruit no because when you look at um one john i think it is again talks about the progressiveness of sin in our lives all of us are imperfect and all of us will make mistakes and um, have times when we shout at the kids or kick the dog or um, cover up uh, something we don't want people to know by lying. We're all going to have times of sin, but there's a difference between sin and habitual sin. Mm -hmm. And habitual sin is what leads to death. Is my character one that you will see me getting cross with people in different scenarios? Is that the, the nature of my life? Is that the character? Oh. Uh, but it's an important question, um, Charity, because if you think often where churches who don't have that concept of fruit um, being evidence for ministering, and I'm not just talking leadership, I'm talking ministering in, in, in a wider sense. If the fruit doesn't come as um, qualification to, to, to minister, you can have churches where the leaders or people in ministry are in that position because they're charismatic and yeah. they have the gift of the gab and people are following because of those manifestations of signs, of wonders, of powerful preaching. And yet it's not rooted in, in, in the character and the fruit of the spirit. And that is such um, a dangerous place to be. And they can cover it up to a certain extent because all of us, if we put on a good face, can sound loving. All of us, if we put on a mask, can be generous. But it's when the road hits, when, when trials in our lives come, that is why trials are spoken of a lot. Well, in fact, that was my, one of my verses later on that talk about trials because difficulties in life, whether it's health problems, whether it's um, discouragement, wh whatever it is, help us prove our faith to be the genuine, that kind. And so often those charismatic, wow leaders, it's only when they come into a trial or, or um, when sin is exposed that we realize that that has been a pretense. Does that, does that help, that sort of? Yes, yes, yes. 
Ananias and Sapphira are a classic example yes. of that, right? You know, yes. They, they pretend that they brought their all and yes, it, it just gets exposed. And the sad thing was they didn't need to bring up their all, did they? Right. They didn't need to. Jesus is not about, is, giving is not under compulsion. It's giving because we want to give. And that's a sign that it might be a meager amount, but we give it. And they could have just said, here, we've sold our property. Let me give you half of it. We're wanting, we're wanting to give half to the new church. That would have been fine. Yolanda, what were you going to say? I presume that same idea. They yeah, answered the question. Yeah. And so, yes, they, they are, they're a good example. And so Jesus, it's tragic. And remember what he said back earlier on about not standing in judgment of each other, using our own judgment, not being ready to point out the plank or the chip in someone's eye when we've got a plank in our own. We had that teaching about not being judgmental, but then we went on to the teaching about discernment. There, there is a time when in love, and we've talked about this quite a few times this last few weeks, but there is a time in love that we do need to challenge. Um, you know, I had a situation a few years back where there was a lady in the church that was in, in the worship team and um, was claiming to walk with the Lord. And yet I found out through a back, you know, not because she told me, but I found out that she was living, um, had just started living with a married man. And um, I had to go to her in love and, and basically say, you're claiming to be one thing and you live in another. If you're not a Christian, you're not part of the church, I have no right to be over judge. But if you're going to claim Jesus's name, then you can't be living in this way at odds with that. And it was hard, but she needed to have the opportunity to either repent and recognize it or to admit that, um, that she, I don't know if that makes sense, but there, there are times where we do have to speak the truth in this. I have a question, Nikki. So was there pushback? This person, she, yes, there was big pushback. She refused. Yes. She, um, she, and so we had to take her out of public ministry. She carried on coming to church because we weren't going to stop her, you know, coming. But we weren't, um, she wasn't allowed to be in public ministry because of that. And um, she, you know, we went through that one person goes, two people goes, um, yeah. more go. And I, I'm pleased to say that that has come right, but it was another, it was a year of rebellion and then the relationship failed and, and yeah. yeah, there was a coming back. Yeah, but the hard way, painful way sometimes, that's how it works. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So I would prefer, and that's why I also going on to another subject, another pet subject about false teaching. Teachers have a big responsibility. I feel a, a weight of responsibility because if I were ever to say, you know what, what Jesus said, that doesn't really count nowadays. You know, that's no longer a sin. Um, and then someone went, you know what, Nikki or whatever my teacher is says, culturally that might have been a sin back then but it's not now and we can carry on living this way and then that person one day stands before Jesus because this is talking Jesus is talking that day in the future when he returns and when there is judgment and that person that I've taught says Lord Lord and Jesus says I didn't know you and they say yeah but but you did I was I was told <laughs> I was told I could live this way, that that was okay now in 2021. Um, so there's a big responsibility not to teach falsely um, in this. And I would hate to be responsible for anyone. Yolanda. That reminds me about the place in the Bible, about the, is it the people of Thessalonica, who anytime the, Bible, the preachers pre preached, they went back to check the word. So here God will tell you that it was your responsibility to go back to check the word. And not because we should, so we shouldn't actually swallow everything we think people of authority give us. Yeah, absolutely. We mustn't swallow everything. We should be discernment. But also in James, it says, you teachers, don't many of you be teachers because you're going to be held to a higher account. So there is the personal responsibility to check it, but the teachers have a responsibility to be sound. Any other thoughts? Sorry, sorry, Nikki. Sorry, I just want to say that uh, I think it's in Jeremiah that uh, that God says, uh, you know, the sh the shepherds who lead the sheep astray would be dealt with very firmly, very strictly by God. They they yeah. would receive judgment. 
And uh, although what you said is correct, it's the responsibility of the individual, but even so, because they carry the word of God. And when, when you started with uh, what, what you did this, this evening, what struck me was uh, it is so imperative that we, to appreciate what we have today as a Bible study, and we're studying the word of God really line by line, precept by precept, that we should not let it get watered down when we carry it forward. Because this is how, you know, the generations will, will get a hold of the truth. Because anyway, out there, everything is relative. Yeah. There is, there is no, there is no um, Ravi Zak used to use a particular word. Uh, there is no moral absolute. And, you know, so anything goes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and lest we think that, oh, I'm, like you said, you know, oh, I'm one of the elect. God has not, he told uh, Elijah that I've kept 70,000 people, 7,000 people who've not bowed their knee to Baal. So there are children of God. And the, the thing is to carry the word so preciously in all its truth and in all its integrity and, and carry it on. That's, that's, that's quite a responsibility that we must carry, you know, and God. Is, yeah. You know, it's I mean, a responsibility, isn't it? And it's hard um, to carry it like that. And so, yes, we are in a privileged time, but it's also very sobering as you've been saying this to us all along. And I think for me, the burden's quite, I feel the burden quite heavily. And, and the only reason it's not a burden is because we trust God's spirit is at work and we don't do it in our own strength. But I'm also very, very conscious that Jesus was full of grace to those that were in sin. And as Paul says, um, neither, and then he gives this list of people that aren't going to enter the kingdom of heaven because, you know, the idolater, the, the murderer, the, the homosexual, you know, there's this long list. And then he says, but such were you or such were we before we were cleansed, before, you know, we, we've all been there. And so we need to hold the truth of God's word so highly. And yet at the same time, that balance of love, of grace, of extending grace, of, of telling truths in a way that is not watered down, but nevertheless um, graceful. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so back to our passage. We, um, Jesus said, get away from me. Those that didn't obey his word, get away from me, you evildoers, or other versions say those that are lawless, as in not following, um, keeping God, keeping living in a righteous way. We have to keep on saying we can only do that because we've been made righteous by Jesus's blood and that his spirit in us is causing us to wish to be righteous, causing us to want to live and act in a way that pleases him. Um, Jesus now goes on from that. Any, anyone got any questions before we go on to the next section? Sort of follows on. So um, Letitia, have you got the next section that you can read on your screen? It's 24 to 27 of Matthew 7. Okay. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it has its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these ways of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the wind, winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Amen. Thanks, Letitia. It's a story that we probably know so well from those Sunday school songs about the rain coming down and the floods <laughs> coming up. But it's such, and this is just the incredible thing about Jesus's teaching. Anyone can understand this sort of picture, can't they? And so we, we've got two types of building. What, what are the two, what's the first man? What does he do? The rock, the one on the rock. Yes. The one the on the, in the sun. And on the sand. And so what, what is Jesus saying about the man on the rock? What, what is it that that person does? 
He practices the, the word that he hears. Yes. He hears the word of Jesus, he hears the word of God, and he puts it into practice. And so obviously the comparison is quite straightforward. The unwise or the foolish builder is the one that hears, but doesn't put it into practice. Now, if you know anything about building, which I don't, but if you imagine these two people are building, now they could build a similar looking house. And the only difference be the ground that they've built it on. Now, um, if, we, if we were an architect or, or anything to do with engineering, we would know that it's more important what's under the house than the house in a sense itself because of whether it's gonna stand firm or not. But um, sometimes people that are building can look very similar. It goes back to what I said earlier, can look very similar to each other. Building that house, you know, coming to church on Friday, um, part of a city group, that building might be similar, but, when is it going to be shown what the foundations that we're building on? When does Jesus say that it is going to be shown to be what it is? The wind blows. <laughs> yeah. When it rains. <laughs> and so what is, what is that signifying? What do you imagine the storms, the rain, the wind, what is that in our lives? If our lives are being built, we have a choice of building on the foundation of Jesus. Um, or we when, have when trials and yeah. temptations and the rest come in our way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, Letitia. It's life, really, isn't it? But life brings those those difficulties, those trials. Going back to James, James talks about that in the whole of James 1, there's sort of two parallels that are brought over. Um, the trial coming to our lives and we have a choice. We either go through the trial in God's strength, the way he would have us doing it, that <coughs> right, or we can bypass the trial and make our own plan, which is the temptation. And so we have a trial and trials prove our faith to be genuine. They prove whether we're on solid ground or on sand. Yolanda, would you read our James 1 verse 12 for us? Yeah. James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This reminds me of a book we read. Yeah. Blessed are the one who perseveres. So when those storms of life and we persevere, it says we have stood the test. That word test, and it's used quite a few times in the first chapter of James. Test means to put to proof. It's not like a school test, although in a sense it is, because even a school test will prove whether you've learned your, your chemistry or whatever, but it's putting to proof. So our faith will be um, shown to be true, shown to be genuine. We will be shown to be on that narrow path, walking on that narrow road, um, having entered through the narrow gate. If when the storms of life come and we're all going to face them, we um, stand the test, we persevere. Um, and then that means we will get the crown of life, which is another way of saying that we will inherit the kingdom or we will come into the kingdom. And so either we better or better. Does it mean that if you go through trials of life and you become better, it means that you are you you, you it has refined you, right? Become better, it means that you weren't walking the right path. Sorry, I didn't quite clear, hear you. Uh, Yolanda, are you saying that if when you go for a trial, you don't persevere and you make your own plan, that's a sign that you're not on the right path? Is that what no, you're saying? I'm asking that if you go through the trial, let's say you go through the trial, all right, you came out, but you became better. Instead of a bit, you became a better person. Does it mean that you weren't on the right track or it has proven who you are? Or you come out and you become a better person. That's it. Maybe you hold on to God more. Does it mean that then you are, or is that different from what they're talking about? I think the answer to that is yes to everything. You know, we, we, when we have these, the thing about these pictures that Jesus gives us, um, it's so useful, but we mustn't push it too far. Back to that where I said earlier that the person that's a Christian, true faith, but is lukewarm, looks very similar to the person that has a, not a true faith, claiming it, but, you know, is doing it in their own strength. They look same. Um, every situation is unique. If the person... Um, you know, is if their house is rocking a bit, is that um, 
is that a sign they're not on, I don't want to be prescriptive. Sometimes Christians can go for a trial and just lose it, you know, and turn away from God and say, you're not here for me, God. The good news is that God doesn't give up and go, ha, you don't believe I'm here for you? Phew, let me drop you. He says that, you know, even through that trial, you know, neither height nor depth, nor angel, nor demons, nothing can separate you. If we have a true faith, we, we trust that God will bring us out of that bitterness and to a place of repentance and, and back on a, on a, a strong walk again. Um, I was going to ask her whether they became bitter. Were they, are they still holding on to their faith? Because you cannot come out from the trials or ask God, with God walking you through and you become bitter. If you are bitter, then it means you are bitter against God. You are still not, holding, not in the faith. You learn that if they come out bitter, are they still holding on to their faith or they, they've left their faith? That is a question I'm asking. Did they, um, did they start? With a true faith and then gone you, on. You to can come on. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, no, the person might be still a like Christian, but it's just better that God has just got to know that there's no, yes. without God, you can't do anything. However, God has not got to the person fair. Miss some of what you said, Yolanda, but you're yeah, right. I was going to say, I don't know if it's only my line. Her line is breaking. I can't hear. Yeah, it. internet, internet. Okay. Yolanda, you're right. Um, a Christian can. You're hanging. Again. Oh, you're back again. So the person is. So the let's say the person. I do know there's nothing that he or she can do about it. However. Lost you again, Yolanda. Can you hear me? No, you keep on coming and going. Let me type. Okay, type. But I think you're right in saying that it is quite possible for a Christian who's not um, remaining in the vine and goes through a trial and just get, becomes hopeless. It is possible to come bitter. <laughs> but um, but also someone that claims to be a Christian but actually is just doing the outward works, goes through a trial, can also become bitter. So again, you have this situation that there's no... We can't say for sure that's where that person really needs to to seek God in it. And um, we trust that the true believer, that God will, the work he has started, he will continue and bring them to a place of um, of healing. Audrey. Vicky, while you were speaking, I was reminded the term bitter. So we we're talking about Naomi and Ruth and, you know, Naomi has lost everything, her husband, her boys. And uh, now it's time. I mean, there's there's a famine where they're living in. So now she's going back to the house of bread. And uh, she is so broken. And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Bitter. Mm -hmm. But God has a different plan for each of our lives. And God, even though we may feel bitter, uh, God is a God of covenant love. We learned that at KH yesterday. His purpose is going to stay steadfast. I mean, it's going to take an act of absolute rebellion on my part to say, get away from me, God, I'll have nothing to do with you. But when God comes and he just brings his love and, you know, we have a relationship with him, but our circumstances have been so trying that, yes, it can cause us to probably second guess sometimes and even sink into despair. Yes, it happens, but he's not going to let us go. And when we encounter him, we're back. You know, yeah. in, in, in that place of hope, in that place of believing, in that place of saying, yes, he's done it before, he'll do it again. And he did, <laughs> you know, yeah. for Ma, the woman who called herself Mara, he filled her, her uh, you know, her lap again with a grandchild. And then the lineage, Jesus, I mean, just think, a, a situation which was a woman who called herself bitter and then see the outcome of that. Yes. You know? Yeah, Audrey, it's a good example. You're absolutely right. It, bitterness can come to any of us. I'm not ever going to say it could never happen to me because you, you do not know what tomorrow yeah. holds. And But if we have a true salvation, if we, on that narrow path, we can trust as um, that what God has started, he will take to completion. Yes. And, um, but sometimes that bitterness or a, a turning from God in a trial is a sign that we have in fact been building on sand. Yeah. So both are possible. And um, yeah. And so Jesus felt that he needed to end his sermon, pointing out the differences, the wide road, the narrow road, 
the um, the unwise, the foolish builder, the fool, um, the wise builder, the the fruit, the no fruit. I've got those mixed up, but but he he wanted to make it really plain for us, and because and also the gravity, as you said earlier, Audrey, the 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 gravity of it. We do not want to one day realize that actually we have built on sand and, um, and that we're on that wide road. Um, trials are one of the ways that give proof to our faith. Nevertheless, whatever they are, they give us, trials are a way of causing us to, to cling to, to Jesus, to obey his word and to um, stand firm, even though everything around us is is in chaos, in the storm. Hi, Yolanda. Sorry you're having trouble with your internet. Yolanda, did you have anything else to ask before we uh, move on? Okay, so we only have two more conclusion verses that aren't part of the teaching. So before I move on to that and um, recap, the whole of the, the three chapters of Jesus's sermon so that we can have a the end with a, a wide lens. Um, any other thoughts about what we've been looking at tonight? Those that say, Lord, Lord, and him saying, I didn't know you. And the, the person that builds on the rock and the person that builds on the sand. Yolanda, anything with you? You look like your mic. You look like you're stable with your internet at the moment. Okay, so our last verses. Um, Charity, would you read our Matthew seven twenty eight to twenty nine? Sure, Matthew seven twenty eight to twenty nine. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Amen. Thanks, Charity. It's hard to imagine because we've always, for all of us here, we've always had the, the Bible available to us. We've always had um, the Gospels to be able to read this. But to the followers of Jesus and the crowd that were listening to this, this would have been revolutionary. This would have turned their, their thinking on its head. It was nothing like the Pharisees that, or the scribes or the, the teachers of the law because they taught um, in a legalistic, follow this, do this, do this. They added their own traditions, piling on this weight on people. You can't, you can't walk this far on the Sabbath. You can't do this. You can't eat that. You can't, and they were bound down by it. And there's this freedom that Jesus is bringing in this teaching that just must have been like, whoa, you know, this freedom, it's heart. And yet at the same time, there probably was some of them that were thinking it actually was easier when it was just some laws that I could tick and do. This is requiring me, more of me. Hence, Jesus saying that the righteous need, needed, the righteousness of them needed to exceed that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Because actually, following a legalistic list of rules is less onerous on us, less burden on us than actually um, committing to a lifelong, passionate um, connection, knowing of God and living in such a way to please Him. For those that are on the path of doing that, we know that there's nothing more joyful and there is nothing more, more incredible and freeing, but it must have been incredible to them, astonishing for them to hear him speak and to speak with absolute authority, which he could do because he was the son of God and um, he was the word incarnate. Any thoughts um, about that before I bring um, all of it together and then I can ask you all for your last thoughts on the sermon as a whole? Audrey, can you unmute? Sorry about that. Why would it be difficult? Why would it be easier to follow a set of laws that you can you know, just say, check, done, uh, as compared to uh, what Jesus was offering. Why would it be so difficult to do the one, I mean, to, to follow Jesus and so easy to do the other? 
I think it's because at the end of the day, if you follow laws, I mustn't remember that rich man that he says, well, I've feel, done all the commandments. I honor my parents. I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't do this, you know, and he says, you know, I've done it. And, um, and then Jesus said, you've heard it say, but I say to you. And so Jesus would say, you've heard it say, don't commit adultery. Well, I'm telling you not to even think about a woman lustfully, which is easier not to commit adultery or not to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's why I think that if you'd have heard, if we'd have heard Jesus saying this, it would have hit us that actually <gasps> this is a higher, higher bar. Yes. Yeah. We're going to find that we don't do it in our own strength. But at this point, they're just hearing it going, whoa. You know, even the disciples, when, when Jesus said, you know, don't, don't divorce your wife and, um, unless it's for marital and faithfulness. And the disciples saying, you know, who's, who's up to this? Who can do this? You know, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I was and doing so, a charity, actually, because charity is the one who throws us. <laughs> such <laughs> I, I'm laughing because two weeks ago, I was discussing the same thing with a friend. That's when you look at the uh, olden days, they had the commandment, 10, just 10 to follow. But God, we, God has summed it up one for us and it's all in love. But with this, it has so much, like you were saying, uh, uh, Nikki, that he says that if you, even you look at the person, with your eyes, lastfully, you have already committed the sin. So which one is her, uh, difficult? And then she stood and said, hey, I haven't thought about that. This is difficult, what Jesus is saying. I said, yes, okay, so what do you do then? Yeah. And it, that is when it all comes to grace. Because if we have the 10, we saw the 10, the 10 rules are so easy. Okay, like I will take, I will not commit. That is when I'm caught in the act. But this one, Jesus says that just looking with your eyes, you have already committed the crime. But my grace is there to make everything perfect for you. So yours is just to walk what he has called you to walk, live in love and say, Jesus, you said when I look at with my eyes, I have seen, but I, I have come and your add to your mercy seat. Mercy is available for us to carry us through. It doesn't matter what we do. And to add to that is that, and I was asking her, so, so she was asking me, so if I look at somebody else, oh, you look pretty, have I seen? And I said, no, <laughs> it's not seen. If you, if you look at that, that doesn't mean you have gone to, it, it's talking about you looking at the person and you last in your heart, oh, I wish I, if I get this person, in bed, that is the sin. It's not talking about when just looking and then, no. But do you have the evil thoughts that, that comes with it? So this is much easier. There is no hard and fast rule about it. But we, as human as we are, we think what Jesus is offering is much difficult than the 10 commandments, but this is much easier. It is the mindset that it comes or that follows that makes it so hard. So it is all is in the mind. So the mind brings us to that place that we think, Lord, no, I can't carry this cross. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think those, as you say, I think those people listening at first glance would have gone, I, this is unpalatable because it is harder. It's raising the bar. And I think it's only when I think those early disciples waiting for Jesus saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit and they're, and you're going to go out and you're going to preach in my name. And they're probably going, you know, you really have a high expectation of us. I, you know, I don't think we can do it. It's only when we come into that relationship, Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit that we realize that actually we can do this because one, as charity says, there's grace. We're going to mess up often. And two, because the Holy Spirit in us is the one who's working us, giving us the desire. You know, I want to live in a way that honors Jesus because his Holy Spirit in me is making me want to follow Jesus. That's what um, Philippians 3 says, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for God is at work in you, causing you to act on will according to his purpose. We work outwardly towards the goal of living a life that honors him as he works in us, giving us the desire and the ability to walk a life that's honoring to him. 
Um, and as we earlier talked about one John about the claiming, another of the claims was if you claim to be without sin, you're deceiving yourself, the truth's not in you. But if you uh, acknowledge your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's grace. We are going to mess up. We are going to have those lustful thoughts or we're going to lust after property or possessions or jealousy or whatever it is. Um, but we have grace and we have forgiveness at the, the throne of grace. Any other questions or thoughts before we sum up the whole of the chapter, the three chapters? Won't take long. Okay, so Jesus, just thinking of the, I just always think it's always nice to have a sort of flow of how the whole the whole of a, a letter goes or the whole of a, a sermon on the mount goes just to see how Jesus is taking us on a journey through it so if we just go back to chapter six verse one or what wasn't verse one but verse two I think it is which is blessed and we saw those beautiful attitudes the beatitudes and we saw that in one sense, they stand alone. They, each of them could stand alone. You could do a Bible study just on one. But we also see that there is a natural progression there, starting off, entering through that narrow gate with that poverty of spirit that recognizes we're sinners in need of a, a God, needing, needing what only Jesus can offer us. We humble ourselves as beggars before a king, and we mourn over our sin. Ours is the kingdom of heaven. So right at the beginning, Jesus is talking about coming into relationship with him through that humbleness, entering in that narrow gate, and therefore having a righteousness already that exceeds that of the Pharisees, because theirs is an outward works, and this is an inner work of God that has positionally placed us in his kingdom. And so we, that's the entering in. So, we, and then we see the beatitudes. You have that progression, the mourning over sin, the seeking after hungering and thirsting after righteousness, the seeking after mercy, becoming peacemakers, becoming those that are prepared to be persecuted for, for righteous sake, for, for sharing and living in a way that honors God. And then that progressed as Jesus went on to talking about by doing this, you're gonna be salt and light in this world you're going to be a light upon a hill he then moves on to talking about the fact that our righteousness is not about the outward appearance of following the laws but it's about the heart and the inner person and he sort of contrasts that with um that of the the hypocrites the the those that just do it outwardly he then goes on to say that um, he hadn't come to abolish the law by no means, he'd come to fulfill it. And then he goes on to those incredible um, times where he says, you've heard it say, but I say to you, you've heard it say, but I say to you, you've heard it say, do not murder, but I say to you, do not say rucker to your neighbor. And so as Audrey, you have just describing earlier, he's moving the bar. It's not about the external, it's about in here. And it was always that way. It's not that the God of the Old Testament wanted an external. He always wanted the eternal. But man had made it about the external. Man had made it about Jesus. Um, God, through the Old Testament, through the prophets, says, I don't want your sacrifices and your offerings if you go back to your market stall and you chart, cheat, again, cheating the person that's buying the grain from you. You know, I want, I don't want sacrifice. I want mercy. I want justice. I want love. And so it always been that way. But man, in, in the way that we tend to do it, we like to box it up and make it laws that make it easy for us to follow. Jesus then went on to three areas of our lives that are very important and can become very outward focused. And that was of fasting, of giving, and of praying. And the, the core of that was, if you're doing it for the, um, the praise of man, then you're going to get your reward from the praise of man. And there's nothing for you in heaven. But if you do these things privately, because it's part of your connection with me, it's part of your relationship for me, then there will be there will be um, reward in heaven to do with that. And so don't be a hypocrite that practices outwardly righteousness. Let it be, again, something of true righteousnesses of the heart. He then goes on to talk about the do's and the do nots. And there's quite a few do nots. He says, do not store up your treasure in heaven, but store up your treasure on earth, because where your treasure, sorry, 
that's the wrong way around. Don't store up your treasure on earth, but store it up in heaven because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. He then says, don't worry about eating and drinking. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't say you're going to do this or do that. He says, don't stand in judgment against other people, but do show discernment. Then he went on to look again at prayer, saying that we need to be persistent in prayer. We need to be asking, seeking, knocking consistently. Uh, although we did look in the fact that, that there's more to it as well. We need to be seeking God's will in our prayer as well. He then summed up last week about it all coming down to that royal law. Treat others as you want to be treated yourself. Obviously, the other part he didn't mention was the loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. And then he's gone on to the section we've done this last two weeks. There are choices before you. Imagine that signpost, the narrow road, the narrow gate. Enter through that. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Watch out for those with bad fruit. Your fruit will show where you are on that road. Your fruit will show if you're on the wide road or the narrow road. Be careful of those that claim to be walking on that narrow road and actually are not living that life and are full, have false teaching or not obeying um, because they will one day stand before Jesus claiming Lord, Lord, and he will say, I don't know you. Make sure that you're building like the wise builder on the rock of Jesus because when the storms of life come, you will weather the storm. Otherwise you will be like that foolish builder building on sand. And when the storms come, that house will fall and your claim will be shown to be what it is and um, not in Jesus. And that brings us to the end of the three chapters the summary. A rich letter, any thoughts or questions as we bring it to an end? It, there's this question that is running through my, my, my head, my mind. Uh, is that uh, the book of Matthew, all that we have studied, wasn't Jesus addressing it to the Pharisees? Because we, we can see the, the character of Christ now display when you read the book of John. So does that mean, I, I, to me, I, I'm looking at it that uh, Matthew wasn't written for us, it was written for the Pharisees because they were thinking of works that would take them to heaven. So what about us today? Is it also applicable to us? I think it's very applicable to both. Charity, I, I tend to think, I mean, I'm not a theologian in any sense or scholar, but I tend to think that the Sermon on the Mount encapsulated a, a lot of teaching that teacher, Jesus didn't say this just once. You know, we read Mark and you've got elements of it coming through and that. I think that the disciples, inspired by the Holy Spirit, brought a lot of key teaching from Jesus, again, inspired by, by God to be presented in a certain way that we can sort of, we can see the working of it. But I think that Jesus said this in many places, in many different ways, using quite a lot of the similar illustrations. So I'm sure there would have been many Pharisees that would have heard it. But it's just as rich to us um, today. Um, as it was to them then, and just as relevant um, and challenging as to the Pharisees or the followers. Any other thoughts? Audrey, your, your mic is not on. Yes, uh, I was saying in Matthew 16, 6, Jesus uh, warns us against the East of the Pharisees, right? He says, uh, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's, it's, it's a warning to us all, not, I mean, he's using them as an example of what can happen even in our time, and it does. So it's, oh, it's yeah. a lesson. It's Absolutely, a lesson. we can be whitewashed tombs. We can yeah. put on yeah. a mask yeah. and look clean on the outside when there's undealt with stuff inside. Exactly, yeah. I think that's true of almost uh, the whole Bible. It is written to a specific target audience of that time, but it is still relevant even today, whichever yeah. part of the Bible we take. Yes, absolutely. Every, every scripture is useful, isn't it, for correcting teaching and training in righteous living, that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. There's nothing wasted, whether it's a genealogy 
or um, what, whatever it is, whether it's instructions on the building of the temple, there are truths in every part of, of the Bible. Rich, rich, um, I don't think that by the time we finish our life, we won't have had a time to really plumb the depths um, of all the richness of his word.